Well, Bertram sat back comfortably in their small room as his wife, Georgetta, was rocking their nine-week-old daughter, Eliza, to sleep after a full day. Their two-year-old son was already fast asleep. You know, every parent dreams of setting up their children for success in the future in any way possible. And that was largely why Bertram had made the decision that he had made. In just a matter of days, everything about their lives was about to change forever. He knew it wouldn't be easy, but both he and his wife felt that the challenge lying before them was worth the risk because they knew they wouldn't be doing it on their own. See, Bertram and his wife had made the decision to pack up everything they owned and relocate their family to Wichita, Kansas. There, they had friends and family that could provide more significant work and a better income for their young family. So 25-year-old Bertram and his wife Georgetta chose to pack up everything they held dear and make the move. Now, little Eliza was only nine weeks old, but they felt now was the time for this transition, even though it might be the, a dangerous time to travel with a baby so young. The first few days of the journey to their new home was wonderful and exhilarating. After all, the room they got to stay in, it was brand new. I mean, it, just, it had just been built. It had just left the shop. I mean, everything had that new smell. The hallways, the walls, even the blankets and the pillows had never been slept in before. Everything. And there was so much to do there. They would never get bored in such a place. You would also be able to interact with people in the hallways, literally from around the world. All of that changed, though, on the fourth day. That night, as Georgetta was trying to put Eliza to sleep, sitting there with great anticipation about this new future they were building for their kids, all of a sudden, Beltram felt a strong jolt, the kind of thing that you would never anticipate feeling, especially here, especially where you were, especially where you were traveling to. So Bertram, slightly alarmed, walked out of their room and down the hall and was gone for a few minutes. Georgetta waited patiently with the children, not sure what to do next until a few minutes later. Bertram burst through the doors, noticeably shaken, instructing his wife immediately to wake the children and get them dressed because they had collided with something. And Bertram knew that the room they were staying in, even though because it was third class quarters, it would be the most dangerous place for them to be if the worst case scenario played out. So this husband, this father, thinking about his family, was determined to get them on the top deck as soon as possible. Now originally, they'd purchased tickets to travel from London to New York City on board a ship called the Adriatic. But due to a strike that was happening and, and limiting the amount of coal that was available, instead, they traded in their tickets for a room on the newest, most exotic luxury cruise liner ever designed, ever built. They were aboard the maiden voyage of the unsinkable ship, the Titanic. Bertram led his wife and two young children to the top deck, where the lifeboats were just beginning to be deployed and filled with passengers out into the frigid water below. And because Bertram acted so quickly, his wife and children were three of the very first to vacate the doomed vessel. But Bertram was not permitted to board the lifeboat with his family, even though the first few lifeboats, when they were released and launched into the water, were only half full at best. The priority was getting the women and children to safety while the men waited hoping for an emergency ship, the Carpathia, to come in time to rescue them. That night, Bertram Dean was one of the 1,500 that went into the water and was never found leaving behind his wife and two young children. You know, I remember uh, 22 years ago when the movie Titanic came out, just a gripping, compelling visual of something that happened now 105 years ago. And the way that the story played out on screen was just dynamic. I remember at that time I knew about the Titanic, but I didn't know much about the Titanic. And in contrast to many movies that are often made based on a true story, there was so much about the film version that was incredibly accurate. And it was a movie that both then and now, for, for many people, it's incredibly moving. Now, it's been 22 years since the movie came out. So if you didn't know how the movie ended and I just ruined it for you, that's your fault, okay? 
Uh, you can literally find a video cassette of this film. I think they have to stock it at every thrift store in America for about 50 cents. So, and on Wednesdays, I think you can get it half off. So for a quarter, you can find, you remember the dual cassette, two tape of Titanic? But I remember sitting there in the theater watching this eight-hour movie play out on screen and watching the lifeboats get lowered into the frigid water with empty seats on the boats. And they just did such a good job in the script and the filming of this. To, to evoke emotions out of those watching. You can just feel the desperation of humanity's hopelessness, just the, 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 knowing that so many would drown in the darkness. But there's a moment where that feeling of desperation and impending doom is kind of completely transformed into anger. There was one scene of the movie that collectively kind of made all of America angry when they watched it. And, and, and it was a movie depicted so well in this scene. But it's not just that it was in the movie that made it so, so challenging and, and horrifying, but it was the fact that it actually played out this way. That's something that still to this day, when we think back about the story of the Titanic and the, the, the horror of it, it, it's still infuriating. It was the fact there were so many empty seats on the lifeboats. While there were so many people minutes away from death, while others just stood idly by and let it happen. I mean, can you imagine that night? Can you imagine being there in the open water, hearing those screams, voices crying out for rescue? 18 lifeboats went into the water. Two of them were not able to be launched before they were tipped upside down. And yet all 18 of them were rowing away from the boat, away from the people entering into the water. When it was all said and done, there were 472 empty seats in lifeboats. Most, most of those that were still in a lifeboat at that point as it was playing out were hunched over, eyes closed, plugging their ears because they could not stand the terror or horror of the voices they could hear, knowing they were about to die. I mean, when you see that scene, even now when you think about it, doesn't judgment kind of rise up in your soul? Like, don't you think to yourself, how could they? How could anyone just row away and keep moving away when the, the boat is submerged, when, when there's people just floating there? There were so many life preservers, and, and, and they're just floating there, and, and, and they only have moments to be rescued until it's too late. How selfish can someone be to not be willing to set aside their fear and the risk in order to go and rescue even just one person? What were they thinking? What was going through their mind? I don't want them to rock my boat. It's too dangerous. We could capsize. We could tip. It's, it's not worth the risk. I'm afraid. I mean, they were right there, right next to somebody's dad, right next to somebody's mom, just a hundred yards away from a, somebody's brother or sister, from somebody's son or daughter like Bertram that had his whole life in front of him. By the time that one boat had the courage to go back in towards the survivors, they were only able to find nine people still alive in the water. And of those nine, three died shortly thereafter because they'd reached a point they couldn't come back from in that condition. Now you're probably wondering, it's January. It's a beautiful day outside. It's a great day to come in and feel motivated to worship God. And this is the most depressing way to start a message you've ever heard, right? Why are you bringing up the horrific story of the Titanic's failed maiden voyage? That's a good question. And I'm doing this really to just tell, use a modern story to also evoke some emotion from us, to draw attention to something most of us would like to think if we were there, if we were in a boat, we would have been motivated to turn it back towards people in need. That if most of us were, were there, if most of us were in the open water, we'd like to think that we wouldn't have just sat idly by and, and ignored what was going on, but we would have tried to even just rescue one or two or three. And so for the next three weeks, we're going to be doing a, a mini-series called Rescue. And it's really all based on one sentence in the book of Matthew. It's the first invitation Jesus gave to some strangers that he came across, inviting them to become a disciple, to become a learner, a student, a follower. And here's what Jesus says 2,000 years ago to four ordinary young fishermen on the shore of the Sea of Galilee after a long day of work. Jesus says this, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, come follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. 
I mean, Jesus basically looks at these guys he just met, and he says, guys, I want to invite you to come hang out with me. Just come spend time with me, follow me, and over time, I'm going to show you how to live life completely differently. I'm going to actually teach you how to row your boats to where people are desperate, and I'm going to teach you how to be a rescuer of people. Now, we can be quick to kind of let our heart burn with anger or judgment, finger pointing towards the people on the lifeboats that we see in the movie, knowing it really happened that, they, that, that, that 17 of the 18 lifeboats didn't have the courage to go back into the waters to try to rescue even just a few. I mean, we see that they witnessed the hopelessness of what was happening. They heard the cries for help, knowing that people were, were, were going were to be dead in a matter of moments. And it can be easy for us with judgment in our heart to kind of point a finger, say, how could you do that? How could you let that happen? What would compel you to not, be, to, to not care about your fellow man or woman enough to, to, to try to rescue some of them? But what if the church of Jesus in our day is guilty, just as guilty as the Titanic survivors that night? What if those of us that are followers of Jesus, believers, what if we're so caught up in our schedules and our plans and pursuing our dreams and chasing our comforts, we're so focused on our independent lives and our desire to not be infringed upon and not be inconvenienced too much and have not too much asked of us, what if we're so self-focused, even as followers of Jesus, that we're rowing our boats right past people that are treading water and they don't even know they're looking for rescue? And soon they're going to dip under the surface. See, I think the invitation Jesus gave to his first disciples was him really inviting them to choose to live a life as a lifeboat. I mean, if you're a Christian, a Jesus follower, we're, we're set free so that we can be a pathway for others to experience the freedom we found. We're blessed to be a blessing. We're, we're, we're a, a, a reconciler. We've been given the ministry of reconciliation, reconciling people with their Heavenly Father. We, we've, been, we've been sent out as rescuers the same way God sent Jesus here to seek and save that which is lost. He says, now I'm sending you with that same mission to seek and save those who are floating and treading water and in desperate need. We are a transforming presence, not the same as we were yesterday or a week ago or a year ago because the Holy Spirit is at work in us bringing to completion what God has begun. Jesus told his first disciples exactly what he was inviting them into. He said, you guys are lifeboats. The church is filled with lifeboats. The question is, are we in our lifeboat alone? rowing at our own pace, doing our own thing, not wanting to be inconvenienced too badly? Or are there other people that we've kind of invited in for the ride. People around us that we can see, they're hurting, they're questioning, they're doubting, they're wounded, they're broken, they're struggling, they're desperate, they're searching. And, and those things may be latent under the surface where they don't even realize how broken they are and they don't even realize how much they're ser hurt searching. They don't even realize how desperate they are right now. But we can see what God is up to there. The beautiful thing about this invitation that Jesus gives to his disciples is he not only tells them who they'll become if they follow after him, but he also tells them how this will happen. He says very clearly, I will make you fishers of men. He doesn't say, you're going to figure out on your own how to become this. He says, no, I'm going to show you, my life will be a model for you of how to point it in the direction of a new destiny to fish for people. Jesus really takes the guesswork out of it for us because we don't have to figure out, well, how do we do this and how do we get there? And we just get to do it like Jesus did it. And before you kind of get overwhelmed with like, well, why? Yeah, but Jesus was God and he knew all the, all the mysteries of the universe and, and he always knew what people thinking and feeling like, I don't have that. But, but, but before you go there, before you feel guilty for not talking about Jesus more with people or before you feel ashamed for not offering to pray with people more, than you do. And before you hang your head, it's like, God, he's probably really disappointed in me. Hold on, don't go there. For a moment, I want to show you how Jesus brought people into his lifeboat. I mean, just look at it. Look at it here with the, 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 the first four disciples he invites. This is so easy. And it's something that if, if we're honest, we're already doing this. We're already doing what Jesus has shown us to do. We're just not doing it with the intention or the desire that, that aligns with the heart of God. And so in a way, I'm kind of giving you permission to kind of look at your relationships maybe differently than you ever have. I mean, when you look at all the people Jesus interacted with, from Jews to Greeks to Romans to Samaritans, when you look at the people that were like the, the elite class, the officials, to, to those that were peasants, from the educated to the uneducated, from the wealthy to the poor, from those people that, that society deemed as morally bankrupt to those who, kinda, who, who, were, who were kind, generous, good people, 
No matter who it is Jesus encounters or, 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 or in, in, uh, engages, he shows us how he rows his boat up next to people. And this is what he does. He listens to those who didn't feel heard. He looks into the eyes of those who feel like they've been looked over. He wrapped his arms around and held those who had felt isolated, some of them for years. He touched those that were considered to be untouchable. He encouraged those who were incredibly discouraged. He comforted those who were deeply afflicted. He told stories of hope to the hopeless. He listened to the stories of the hurting. And he shared what he had with those who were in need. He didn't have a lot of money, but by the power of God and the work of the Holy Spirit through him, he gave incredible gifts to those in need. In fact, we even know he partied with those people. That's, that's, he hung out and spent time with the people most religious people wouldn't be caught dead around. See, Jesus gives us an incredible image of what it means to invite people into our lifeboat. He gives us an invitation as his follower to go fishing for people. An invitation to help him with the work of rescuing. We, we don't really bring people to, to a rescue. We don't transform them. We just kind of are, we're kind of the boat that brings them to safety. We bring them to Jesus. And he's the one that does the work. All we do is kind of pull them up out of the water and then he begins to go to work through us. Where people who don't know Jesus can meet Jesus through the body of Jesus, the, the church. If we're willing to do what we read in our worship time from Ephesians 5, make the most of every opportunity God gives us. I want to share something with you that's incredibly practical, and, and, and I hope you might consider it, because I think this is a tool that has the potential to kind of unlock your heart in some pretty big ways. And like I said, it's not really to change anything you're already doing, but maybe to change the why you're doing it. Because most of us would say we have relationships with people. Are they as intentional and focused as they could be? And do we recognize the opportunities God has placed before us? So if we look at the model of Jesus, I want you to look at the screen. Jesus did this combination of invitation and challenge. The invitation you kind of see is the green line that's vertical. Challenge is the horizontal line. And so this creates four quadrants. And if you're aware of all of like growth trends and stuff, you want to go up and to the left, right? So the bottom left quadrant would be like the weaker areas. The top right quadrant would be the stronger invitation, stronger challenge. Now, Jesus always began by inviting people into relationship. He says that right here in Matthew chapter 6, right? He says, come follow me. He basically says to these guys, hey, come on, let's hang out. Come hang out with me. And, and then there's going to be something transformative that's going to begin to happen as you experience challenges later on. He basically says, I care enough about you to get to know you. And I want you to get to know me more than that. I want you to get to know my father through me. We have to recognize that the invitation that God has given to the disciples to fish for people is they don't have to fix anybody. We don't have to fix anybody. We don't have to try to convert anybody. We can't convert anybody anyway. We aren't trying to do anything other than just love people. I mean, that's the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Just love God and love people and let the Holy Spirit have it from there. And he'll do it. He'll open doors. It's recognizing that every person on the planet, man, woman, and child, is a child of God. They're our Heavenly Father's kids. Some of us, some of them on the planet, are reconciled with their Heavenly Dad. Others are estranged from their spiritual family. We don't even need to know how to bring clarity to all of that. We just got to be willing to love them. And, and so we do this on a regular basis anyways, but, and we also don't need to be taught how to engage someone in relationship. So sometimes like, well, how do we evangelize and how do we share our faith? And you know what? The Holy Spirit takes care of that. All we have to do is love people. That's it. We just have to, we just have to be willing to say, hey, let's get coffee. Hey, Let's go get coffee. Hey, I'll tell you, why don't you guys come over to our house for coffee? Hey, why don't we go out to dinner? Why don't you come over to our place for dinner? Sure, we'd love to go over to your place for dinner. Let's do something together, right? Let's go out to dinner because we're not very good cooks anyways, right? Let's go out and eat. Let somebody else make it. And we want to treat. Oh, you want to treat us? That's great. Thank you. Let's go do something with our kids together as a family. Let's, let's go see a movie. Let's, let's go see a show. Let's go see a concert. Let's go to a ball game. And then let's do all those things all over again more and more times. I mean, Jesus, that's what we see in him. He just invites people to do life with him, and they begin to change. He invites people into his lifeboat because he knows that his heavenly father sent him here to seek and save those who are treading water. 
or drowning. But it starts with an invitation. This is what you can kind of call big invitations. Where we give big invitations. There's no agenda. There's no end goal. There's an intentionality. There's a hope. There's a prayer that that someone would come to faith in Jesus Christ. But we have no idea the timetable. We have no idea how long it will take. We have no idea if we'll be the one to do it. They may move away in five years and, and, and we... and and. But we're just going to be faithful. We're going to be obedient. We're going to love people where they are, hoping that God is using us as we keep our focus loving God and loving other people. These are big invitations where relationships start and grow. And we just set ourselves free from trying to initiate things. We're just inviting people in. We're just being family. We're treating everybody like family, the way Jesus treated everybody like family. And, and invitations are, are, are agenda-free. They're comfortable. They're cozy. I get to know who you are, and you get to know me. I get to hear your story. You get to hear my mine. This is a high invitation, very small challenge. Let's get coffee. Let's have a meal. Let's go to a movie. Uh, let's play board games, whatever it is. Now, the other line on this matrix is challenge. There's big challenges. There are little challenges. Big ones to the right, little ones to the left, but you kind of see this crossover between invitation vertically and challenges horizontally. And we're going to get into this a little bit more over the next couple of weeks. But I'm hoping today to kind of set some of us free from unreasonable expectations. See, some of us are terrified to talk to people about Jesus, talk to people about our faith, offer to pray for somebody. And that's oftentimes because we have often felt like we don't know how to evangelize, but yet we feel we have to evangelize. We feel like we're challenged. We have to reach out and try to save souls. And so some of us, we don't know how to save people, so we just do the best that we can. But honestly, we don't do it enough, and we always feel guilty, we always feel shame, we always feel like we're disappointing God. And and for many of us, we're terrified of it. And this leads to a great amount of stress, because we feel this incredibly big challenge, but we don't recognize the invitation we've been given for it to operate in the the realm of relationship. And that's why we have stress. I have to do this. I'm I'm supposed to. God's expecting it of me. And, And my pastor in the church, they're expecting it of me. I'm supposed to talk about my faith. Now, there's others of us, you may not be terrified to talk about Jesus and your faith. Maybe you're fine entering into those discussions. But oftentimes we do feel the same pressure that we have to seek and save that which is lost, that the mission of Jesus has been extended to us. And so at times we kind of bring up the gospel truth about sin and separation from God in awkward places and ways. Take for example this, exam- take for example this illustration, don't do this, don't be this guy. Don't be that guy. We, we want to we do everything we can to draw people to a Savior who is kind And his kindness leads us to repentance. And there is a reality of hell. There's a reality of separation from God. But what attracts us to God is not the reality of the opposite place. It's the beauty of our dad. Big invitations bring people into our lives so we can get to know them and fall in love with them. So that when when we do get to share about faith, we do get to tell our story, we actually have legitimacy. See, the challenges come later in a relationship. The deeper dialogue comes later after the relationship is forged. But then you care enough about the person. It's not just simply to, to try to, to, to get them to change, but it's about doing life with them. And, and you want to live out this life in relationship to them. I mean, some of us need to stop talking about sin and hell when we pick up our kids from a play date. We need to just invite that family out for a family play date and get to know them. Some of us need to stop trying to convert the server at that restaurant we just met, thinking, feeling this pressure that we've got to do it, we've got to tell them because maybe now's the moment and they may not have tomorrow. We need to trust God. We need to make a choice that if we feel the Holy Spirit leading us to this person, okay, every week I'm going to frequent this restaurant, I'm going to sit in this person's area, and I want to get to know this server and care about them and see what doors God begins to open. Those times for challenges will come, big challenges and little challenges, where we get to have those dialogues, those conversations, where we can serve them, where we can help, where we can listen. But the relationship always has to come first. The relationship is the foundation for our testimony to matter, to to be credible. I mean, us caring for people is what gives our testimony credibility. If all we're doing is spouting off what we think we know, Without people experiencing how much we care, it doesn't have leverage or influence. Authentically caring about people takes time. We have to be given permission in our culture to lean in and share what's changed our life. You know, Jesus' first invite to the disciples was, come follow me. That was it. Come hang out with me. Let's have a relationship. And and I'm going to show you how to fish for people because they were fishing for fish. And that would have been like a curious, like, wow, what does that look like? Do you know what Jesus didn't say, but he did say later? 
He said, come follow me. And if you're gonna follow after me, you need to hate your mom and dad. And you need to be willing to take, pick up your cross and carry it and die. They would have said, yeah, we're good with our dad's fishing. That's a good plan. We'll just stay here, right? That came later, the challenge. The initial invitation was relationship. Get to know me, get to know my father, find out who I am and why I'm here. That the Messiah God has promised has arrived. And see how that begins to change your life. In the same way the Holy Spirit filled Jesus, empowered Jesus, and revealed to people around Jesus who the Father was and the truth of Christ, the Holy Spirit can do the same through us and point people to Jesus, draw people to Jesus. But there's two other quadrants in this matrix, the one there on the bottom left that has some text in it now. Some of us may hear this, and, and the truth is you may be bored in your faith, like just complacent and coasting. And you may not be forging relationships with much of anybody, inviting them into your life. And, and you may not be accepting any challenges, big or small. And you're just kind of, uh, you're just kind of blah. You know, it's interesting, history tells us one of the reasons the first three or four lifeboats on the Titanic were half full or less is because most of the people didn't think it was life-threatening. They were just like, yeah, they'll figure it out. This is the unsinkable ship. And they weren't thinking, well, we need to be safe. We can always get back on the boat, but we need, to get, we need to get to safety. And so that's one of the reasons history, they had to get the other lifeboats in the water so they couldn't wait. They had to lower them off so they could row away so they could drop other ones down. And historically, there was an account of one boat coming down almost on top of another one, which you saw that play out in the movie as well. That was a, a real moment that happened in the rescue. But boredom happens when, when we're just complacent. We just take things for granted when we're just going through the motions and we're not living life on life with people. Maybe just living Sunday to Sunday, showing up to worship gatherings when it's convenient in your schedule, not really accepting any challenges, maybe not practically looking to walk in greater levels of faith or trust of God. The sweet spot of growth, though, is the opposite of this. It's the origin of where we find happiness through the joy that we find in relationship to God, where big invitations and big challenges are found, where growth happens. We say, wow, God, because we have these relations, a relationship with God that is all-consuming and nurturing, and we have relationships with other people. We're inviting people into life to live life with, and at the same time, we're getting to encourage one another in our faith development and growth. This question only, now I want to ask a question, but it only applies to those in the room that you would say you're a follower of Jesus. I want to ask you just a question, rhetorically, you don't have to answer me, just think about it. Do you believe Jesus is the only hope that people have? Do you believe, well, let me, let me, kind of, let me use the, the Titanic illustration to kind of help you. Do you believe, knowing how history played out, the Carpathia was four hours away from getting there to rescue, the boat sank, I believe, in 80 or 90 minutes. It was very quick from the moment of impact to the moment when the Titanic was under the water. Do you believe that the only chance of rescue the people in the water had were lifeboats? And the bottom line was there wasn't enough lifeboats. There was only 20. It should have had 48. In, for everybody on board. It needed 20. The only path they had to rescue was the lifeboats because the Carpathia would not be there. There would be nothing else to get to those people in time. Do you believe Jesus is the only source of hope and rescue people have? Because that's what the gospel makes crystal clear. There is no other path to God, no other path to heaven, no other path to, to uh, uh, reconciling with our creator than that through Jesus Christ, his life, death, and resurrection. That's what the gospel declares unequivocally without question. And so if you really believe Jesus is the only hope people have, the second question we have to ask ourselves is, do we really care enough about people that are floating in the water around us to share with them about the hope we profess? Or are we just kind of waiting for some other boat maybe to row close to them and they can handle it and we can just kind of keep rowing our boat where we want to go? I mean, Jesus spent a ton of his time with people that were not interested in church at all which is a good thing for us because we live at a time and in a culture where most of the people in our lives don't, want to, don't really have any interest in church either, right? I mean, I would guess most of us, or the people we interact with on a daily basis, they're not really interested in church stuff, right? I mean, you can kind of nod along with me, right? They don't, they're not interested. And yet, what do we often do? We keep inviting them to church stuff that they already know they're not interested in. It doesn't make a ton of sense. But what we do know people are interested in, especially at a time in which social media is causing people to feel more isolated and lonely than ever, is people to go through life with. There's this huge opportunity, this huge open door for God to use. 
We're willing to step outside of maybe our own agenda and our own calendar and our own schedule and our own desires and dreams. And so I just want to give you permission in a way to be set free today. I know you're already engaged in relationships with people you work with, people in your neighborhood. I, I know you have great intentions to see those relationships grow and yet you're kind of locked in this tension that I am. We're so busy. We're so, there's so much going on. The schedule's so tight. But I want to give you permission. One, you don't have to invite people to come to church. Let that be a challenge that comes later on. In fact, this idea of coming to church is really bad theology. We don't go to church. The church is not a place we go to. It's not an event once a week. The Bible's crystal clear. The church is the people. This is a building that's a tool for ministry that eventually won't be here anymore. It'll be gone. Does that mean the church is gone? No. The church is the people of God. The children of God. And so this idea that people don't experience, they, have, they don't come to church, actually, they experience the church every day. Because you're the church and I'm the church. What's their experience like? Is it drawing them towards God? Or pushing them away from Him? And besides, when the day comes where you get to extend an invitation to someone you care about, to come with you to a church event, where the church is gathering and worshiping and celebrating, now all of a sudden your joy goes through the roof because you know who they are. You know their story. You know their searching. You know what's been going on. You know their burdens. And now you're elated that God's opened the door and they've said yes to explore what God might communicate to them through a, the gathering of the church. I want, to give, I want to give you freedom. You don't have to try to convince people they're a sinner. I believe that with the number of people that I've talked with that are just incredibly far from God, most people don't measure up to their own standards. So they know if there's a God out there, they definitely don't meet his. So we have to keep reminding people of how they fall short. Most people have so many insecurities and they wrestle with their failure so much as a spouse, as a parent, as a friend, as a son or a daughter to their parents. That they don't need reminded how much they fall short. Now there's a moment and a time that comes where we need to understand we'll never measure up based on our performance. I'm not talking about that. We don't need, we can be set free from the expectation on ourselves to try to change somebody, to try to fix somebody. I believe the Holy Spirit will open that door and then when there's a relationship, these people will lean in to ask your opinion, to ask for feedback, to ask for wisdom from you. Because they trust you, because they know who you are, because there's a foundation of love the relationship is built on. We just need to get to know people's stories. We need to love them and love Jesus and along the way see the doors that the Holy Spirit begins to open through that loving relationship. So there's a very specific reason we're talking about this right now. There's, there's a very specific reason why this mini-series is happening today over the next three weeks. And it's because in our culture there is a huge opportunity coming where we can actually use our living rooms and our kitchens as a lifeboat in a very, very practical way with people that we've had great intentions to engage relationally for a very long time. Uh, and it, it's Sunday, February 2nd, Super Bowl Sunday. It's the biggest television event of the year. Many of us watch it, most of us do, and if we don't even watch a second of football, we watch commercials, or we just get together to eat spreads like this. If you have this kind of spread set up like a football stadium, I'm coming to your house. That's amazing. Good old Google images. But, but here's what I want to ask you to consider. I want to ask you to consider to set aside Super Bowl Sunday as a mission night, as a lifeboat night. Where you invite, now I'm not saying sometimes we think bigger is better so I can have 40 people in my house. No, the whole point of this is relational connections. You can't do that with more than one or two families. You can't hear a story and share life together and, and not even turn on the game and play board games the whole time and eat food, whatever it is. But the point is you can have too many people and miss out on opportunities God wants to open. So I'm not looking at, okay, how many people can people fill their houses with? That's not the point. The point is one or two families that you've had a desire, you've had an, 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 an inclination to want to get to know this family of friends of your kids or, or these neighbors across the street that just moved in or these people down the street you haven't connected with in a long time. Whatever it is, I believe the Holy Spirit's already planted these seeds in us to say, yeah, we've talked about it, we've intended it, we've, we've wanted to, but the schedule's so busy. Now I'm giving you permission to say, okay, this is it. Super Bowl Sunday, we want to invite them over. We want to get together with them. And we just want to foster relationship. I mean, many of us are going to sit down 
and relax that Sunday, February 2nd, whether you watch the game or not, and what if we could just invite a few people that are already treading water around us if we just give them an invitation to get in the boat? Now let's ride together for a while. I mean, over the last few years, we've hosted a Super Bowl party here in the building. And we kind of, honestly, what we do is on Sunday at like 4.30, we invite people to come back in the evening, and we put down the big screen, and everybody brings in a dish to pass. It's great, but, but can I be honest with you? What we're doing is we're bringing all the lifeboats here, we're tying them off together, and then we're hanging out on each other's lifeboats. Meanwhile, there's people treading water around us. And the first couple of years we did this, we saw some new people that came into the building and, and hung out with us for a while and then left at halftime and went on about their life. And we just need to kind of set ourselves free from this expectation. If we can just get them through the building, that'll be it. You see that nowhere in the Gospels. There is nowhere in the book of Acts like, we, if we can just get them into the building. Because at that point, they're like, we don't have a building. Right? And the early church didn't have a building. But they met in each other's homes daily. And they shared food together. And they encouraged one another. And they listened to the apostles' teaching. And then they ate a little bit more together shared the Lord's Supper, they prayed together. That's what we see in the early church. Would you be willing to just say, hey, I'll set, I'll, my living room, my kitchen can be a lifeboat, and we'll just see what God does from there. I'm not asking you to do a Bible study during halftime. I'm not asking you to read something awkward that makes people feel condemned in their sin during you know, the, the, the two-minute warning commercial break before the halftime. No, just hang out and live life. Don't try to convince them of anything. The only thing is to just love them where they are, just like Jesus loved us where we were before we came into relationship with him. There's no agenda. There's no end game. There's no timeline. This is not, we got to try to get them saved by a certain date. No. This is just, let's see who's leaning in for relationship and let's see what God might do. Because we have to start with invitation. And we have to invite them into our life before we can ever invite them to faith in Christ, especially at a time in which our culture is so speculative of organized religion. They're so speculative of the church. They're so speculative of Christians. They've got to experience our love, our generosity. Let's not be content just rowing our boats away from a drowning generation in our time, in our towns, in our schools in our workplaces. I mean, people are, are barely keeping their head above water all around us, and they don't even know the darkness. They don't even know the damage they're causing to themselves. And God has placed us there. Where you live is not an accident. Where you work is not an accident. How old you are is not an accident. The relationships you have are not an accident. The people that irritate you in your life are not there by accident. And the reality is, Sunday, February 2nd, you have to eat anyways. Why not invite some people over to eat with you? What could happen in the next couple of years if a bunch of Christ followers decided to just open their doors, the doors of their heart and their soul and their family, to invite some other people in and see what the Holy Spirit might do? If it's not an accident where we are, and if we recognize we're not alone, but the Holy Spirit empowers us, if we recognize he's placed us there, where we are, around the people we are, for a purpose, what could happen? I want, to, I want you to just bow your head and close your eyes, if you would, for a moment. I want to read through Ephesians 5, 14 through 17, one last time, but with the context of what we've talked about. We read this during our worship time. Paul says this to the church in Ephesus. He says, awake, O sleeper, rise up from the dead, and Christ will give you light. So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, right? Don't conform to the pattern of this world. Be transformed. The pattern of this world is crazy, busy, never any space, never any margin. It says, don't live like fools, but live like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Lord Jesus, we need your help. Show us what to do, God. Show us what next. Father, I pray for each person that's here.
prayer over their heart and their soul. Lord, I, I know there's some here today that, that, that love you and have a faith relationship with you. And, and God, maybe they felt this burden of pressure and stress related to sharing their faith for a long time. And maybe this is the first time they're kind of feeling some freedom that they can just love people. But they can also be intentional to pray that through the relationship that, that the people in their life would be drawn to Jesus. Lord, I pray for those that might be considering this very, very simple invitation. That on Sunday, February 2nd, we're not going to have an evening service. That the whole focus of that night is to be missional. To just see how many lifeboats might open up around this region of the world for the purpose of relationship and with a central focus on what God wants to do through us and the lives of people that we want to fall in love with. Because they're our brothers and sisters. They may not know it yet, but they are. We trust you, God. We trust your spirit to move, to work, to lead us. Give us the courage and faith to follow you where you lead. In your holy name we pray. Amen.